Welcome to Make It Last, helping you keep your legal ducks in a row and your nest egg secure with your host, Victor Medina, an estate planning and elder law attorney and certified financial planner. Everybody, welcome back to Make It Last. I'm your host, Victor Medina. I am an estate planning and elder law attorney, as well as a certified financial planner. If you're listening to this live, it's Saturday morning at 7.30 a.m. And if you're listening to this on the podcast replay, it's whatever time it is when you're listening to it. But I'm going to tell you something today. We're going to talk about uh, proactive income taxes, which sounds like it's delightful enough to get your eyes to roll in the back of your head. But I promise I'm going to make it as fun as I can. But before I do that, because we're on an early morning uh, breakfast kick, I want to talk to you about uh, yogurt. <laughs> I know, right? You didn't you didn't come into this to listen about yogurt. This is a retirement podcast. What am I talking about? Well, look, I'll tie it in this way. If you're not healthy, <laughs> then you won't grow old enough to go to retirement. But here's the thing. I had the absolute best yogurt I have ever tasted. I had it this morning. And so I am a huge fan of America's Test Kitchen. Um, this, if you don't know, this is a, a television show on PBS. And uh, what they basically do is they're like little scientists around cooking. So, you know, you watch some cooking shows and the, the you know, you're watching the artiste and they're, they're, they're flinging ingredients around and they're chopping stuff. And you're like, oh, how did you get to that? recipe well the thing about america's test kitchen is you know if they tell you that they want you to stir it 42 times it's because they tested 41 and 43 and it turns out that 42 is better so they test everything and one of the segments that they have uh, are taste tests and so i was watching an episode I, I got like six of these on the dvr and when i'm it's the worst thing to do when i'm hungry i'll watch this and the reason why it's the worst thing to do is because it just makes me hungrier and it looks delightful what they're cooking Anyway, they had a segment on taste test for uh, whole milk Greek yogurt. Greek yogurt is the biggest thing. Every time I go to the grocery store, my wife asked me to bring back, uh, you know, a four pack of uh, Chobani, Kobani, uh, the coconut flavor. And so I, I bring that back. Now, that's not my favorite. Um, I've tasted it. I, I don't tend to like yogurt generally. I mean, I, sometimes I, I eat yogurt, but I don't like that yogurt. And so they did a taste test. They did a taste test of whole milk Greek yogurt. And here's the thing. It grew Greek yogurt from 1% of the yogurt market in 2007 to 50% of the market today. So in 10 years, it took 50% market share. Everyone's buying Greek yogurt. Now, one of the reasons for that is that it's high in protein and uh, it is, you know, something that is they creamy. People, people like it. They like it a lot. So... Most of the yogurts that are available are like the non-fat variety. And I've been working with a dietitian who basically says, stay away from the, from the non-fat stuff, get the whole fat, uh, you know, just eat, eat the right amount of it. And, you know, we'll, we can go from there. And, and here's the thing. I, I really want to uh, like yogurt, you know, and I want to, I want to eat good yogurt. And so they're, they're doing this segment. And they're talking about the difference between these different yogurts that they tested. And, and to start the segment out, they put a spoon inside of the yogurt and kind of left it there. And you would see like the good stuff, the spoon doesn't fall over. And the stuff that, uh, you know, is kind of mass produced, the spoon falls right over. So I really kind of took to it. And uh, I went in and I bought the one that they recommended. And I'm going to share it with you because I think that uh, I think you should go and try it because I, I told you this is the best yogurt I've ever had. But to understand what the difference is between the different options on there, you have to understand how kind of yogurt is made. And so yogurt is made essentially by adding live uh, bacterial cultures to warm milk. And uh, as the bacteria digest the lactose in the milk, um, you know, because milk's got this natural producing uh, sugar, this lactose, they produce lactic acid, which lowers the pH. It coagulates the proteins into a gel, and that both gives the uh, the tang as well as the some of the thickness. Now, to make Greek yogurt, the fermented milk is often strained for several hours through cheesecloth to drain off the clear liquid, which is called whey. So because... Uh, so much of the liquid is strained out. The traditional Greek yogurt starts with three or four more times the amount of milk that is necessary to make regular yogurt. And it's the straining that makes the Greek yogurt tend to um, cost more 
and it's higher in protein. Now, that's the basic traditional process, but to keep up with uh, mass production, manufacturers have you know any kind of number of tricks that they can use to allow that to happen faster and uh, cheaper. So they could change the uh, bacterial cultures. They could change the type of milk from grain or, or grass-fed cows, the fat level, the fermenting time. And um, they can also uh, add a thickening agent called pectin, which is essentially a milk protein concentrate uh, or a whey protein concentrate, um, which avoids... Um, the need for investment in, in costly separators and waste producing systems for the strained whey. So basically by adding the pectin, that allows them to avoid losing all of that volume that they pour down the drain. The problem is that pectin also traps the liquid, which helps prevent the um, separation. And the idea is that the tasting is pretty much the same, but it changes how thick the yogurt becomes so by using pectin you don't get that um that super thickness that's in there and there's a kind of like a mouth taste to it so there's a mouth feel to what you're eating so make a long story short when you look at one of the ones that is strained as opposed to added in pectin really the the one that came out on top was this thing called fage now Fage is spelled F-A-G-E, all right? Uh, and it has a texture that is unlike anything I have tried before. It was phenomenal, phenomenal. It was the best yogurt I've ever tasted. And, you know, it's not much more than a regular Greek yogurt packet. A regular Greek yogurt is $1.20 or something like that. Um, for an individual one, this is like $1.30 or $1.40. But it's so worth it. So worth it. Uh, it was the most phenomenal yogurt. I totally recommend it. Um, and uh, I, I think you should go and try it. <laughs> so we spent the first segment talking about yogurt. Uh, the other thing that I did before we break uh, is I went to go visit my dad over the weekend. It turned 70 years old. And, um, you know, what do I give a 70 year old? You know, give him a watch. You know, he doesn't need a watch. So what we did was um, we, we went ahead and, and booked a uh, photographer to come out and to take a group family photo of us. And this poor photographer, I mean, she was the best, uh, just a delightful person, really got us working uh, well together. But she had to deal with my three kids, you know, one of which is a four-year-old. So good luck with that and a dog. Um, and so we gave her the worst of the circumstances to deal with uh, for, <laughs> for how to take a photograph. Anyway, she did great. My dad had a good time. We took pictures out on the beach where he lives in, in Connecticut. And uh, we've got them up uh, posted on the... Uh, on my Facebook page and, you know, just some of the proof. So we're looking for the rest of them. We'll print it out and give it to them. All right, look, we're going to come back and I'm going to talk about income taxes. I'm going to try to make it as interesting as I can, uh, as interesting as I've made the yogurt discussion anyway. So when we come back to the break, look, I'm going to help you save money. All right, save money on income taxes. So stick with us when we come back. We'll talk about income taxes. This is Make It Last. Hey, it's Bert. You know, I hear a lot from people that the one asset they're most interested in protecting from the devastating cost of assisted living or nursing homes is their own home. The team at Medina Law Group can meet with you to discuss options to help protect that home, including their special Home Sweet Home Trust. It's designed specifically to protect the value of your home in the event that you need long-term care in the future. Just call the experienced elder law attorneys at Medina Law Group at 609-818-0068 to learn more, including your chance to schedule a free consultation. You can also visit medinalawgroup.com to learn more about protecting your assets Assets and the Medina Law Group team. For peace of mind and a solid foundation, call Medina Law Group at 609-818-0068 or visit medinalawgroup.com. All right, welcome back to Make It Last. Uh, we're talking today about income taxes. You know, many people just wait to April to kind of figure out what their income taxes and you know, they're usually not waiting to April. They're looking at in January. But the point is that the tax year has passed them already. And uh, I remember that when I got started, in my practice, I had a client, the proverbial little old lady, um, who came in and, and taught me something. Um, I had a client come in and, and she said, you know, my accountant told me that I could take out $10,000 more and not pay any taxes on it. And uh, I said, well, what did you do? She said, I took $10,000 out. 
I said, but he said $10,000 more. He says, you know, that's funny because he told me again the next year that I could take $10,000 out. So this kind of opened my eyes to this idea of proactive income tax planning rather than reactive income tax planning. Because reactive income tax planning is usually done on the uh, in the income tax form as we try to line up what the deductions are and, and figure out what... Uh, what we can do to reduce the tax bill. And I realize that there's more work that can be done if we're willing to think about income taxes before the end of the year. So we are dropping this show in the middle of July and you have the opportunity to proactively manage your income taxes in the upcoming year. This is timely stuff. And I first want to take the, the time in the first segment to explain why you might want to do proactive income tax planning. It's not just or necessarily about reducing your current income tax bill, but also I'm thinking about future income tax bills. That's the first segment. And the second segment is I'm going to give you essentially um, three things that you can do now in this year that kind of dovetail in with this concept. All right. So again, too many times at the end of the year, our tax bill is just what it is when we prepare it, and we don't take the time to think proactively about income taxes. Proactive income tax planning, which is a concept that I use in my practice with my clients, in most of the time with my financial planning clients. I mean, it's not cost effective to do it on the legal side because for somebody to pay my hourly rate to uh, you know to kind of manage their income taxes, that's not as effective as if we're managing their money and helping them through retirement. But if you fast forward to retirement, one of the biggest things that determines whether or not, uh, you know, how much money you have are your income taxes. You know, your Social Security, that's fixed. You know, uh, your a pension income, if you have some, that's fixed. And what you have saved is largely fixed. You might invest in it and it might grow over time, but that's what you're starting with. You're not going to add to it by future contributions. So the last kind of uh, battle is going to be fought in the area of income taxes and managing income taxes proactively in retirement is one of the best things that you can do. Now we we worry about this for a couple of different reasons. One of the primary reasons has to do with uh, my favorite, you know, married couple families. My married couple families have one big thing that's going to happen, which is that one of them is going to die and they're going to change filing status. They're going to go from filing married to filing single. And the reason why that's a problem is that the single income tax rates are less generous than the married ones. Said another way, you're going to end up paying more taxes sooner on income if you file single than if you pay a uh, file married. To give you some numbers around this, there were you know that there's these different brackets different tax buckets and depending on how much income you make it tells you how much taxes that you owe and so for the first uh for a married couple for the first eighteen thousand dollars your tax rate your tax rate is about ten percent and then between eighteen thousand and seventy five thousand dollars of adjusted gross income you know, after deductions and exemptions that next layer is taxed at fifteen percent if you go past seventy five thousand dollars the next tax bracket is 25%. And so the difference between those two tax brackets is 10%. The difference between 25 and 15, that's 10%. That means if you have to go into the 25% bracket, you're going to pay 10 cents on the dollar more, more than you did on the previous money. Okay. So that's for a married couple, right? You get to the top of the 15% bracket at $75,000. When you file single, the top of that tax bracket is $37,000. It's half of the exemption for the first one or for married people. So what it means is, I'm going to keep talking in numbers, and I know that's, that's complicated, and I apologize ahead of time. There's really no way around it. But if you have somebody who's making $50,000 a year as a married couple, that's kind of what they need to live on. It's 50000 I mean, the other spouse doesn't need that much more. So when you are filing married, that is below the $75,000 threshold. You're paying 15% maximum on that money. When you change to a single filing status, because the limit is $37,000, that means that the amount over that, or another $13,000, is taxed at 25%. The difference between the two rates is 10%. We talked about that. So what it means is that on that $13,000, you're paying $1,300 more of federal income tax 
than you did before just because of your filing status. See, that's a big difference. When you lose $1,300 a year to income taxes, that is huge. Huge. Now, you might think to yourself, well, what can I do about that? Well, most of my clients underutilize their tax brackets in any given year. And what I mean by that is that that couple that's making $50,000 a year of taxable income, they have $25,000 of space in that 15% bracket, right? I told you the top of that was $75,000. So if they're only making 50, the difference between that is 25,000 and that goes unused every year, right? Because we reset to the taxes on every year and we can't ever get that back. So when I'm meeting with a couple and helping them manage their income taxes, what I'm thinking about is making sure that we reduce the impact of losing one spouse, which is obviously a huge impact, right? But I want to make sure that the filing status on the income taxes doesn't negatively affect how much they have to take out. Because if everyone's relying just on taking money out of their IRA to live, then when one spouse dies, you got to continue to take that money out. But if you proactively moved money out of the income tax, uh, out of the IRA and paid income tax on it, and you locked in the income taxes at 15%, you would be able to get together a little war chest of money that you could use to supplement your income. So after the first spouse dies, you don't have to continue to move that money out of the IRA. The next reason why that's helpful is because you're able to reduce the impact of required minimum distributions. Remember, required minimum distributions is the amount that the federal government makes you take out of your account every year based on your age. Well, they multiply a percentage against the account value. So if you leave that account value really, really high, and you've got to take 4% out of that, that is going to fix how much money you have to take out, and it's a bigger number. If you were proactively moving money out and you reduce the size of that, then the percentage goes against a smaller number and the amount that you have to take out is lower. I know this can get confusing. Stick with me on here. But the idea is that you can proactively manage your income taxes today and in the future. And doing that will allow you to save more money overall. That's the goal. Now, do I expect that everyone's going to be able to do this on their own all the time? The truth of the matter is no. I believe that this is most effectively done with an advisor because the advisor then is is responsible for kind of managing that process and making sure that you're you're doing that, making all the calculations, staying ahead of the curve. And it's probably best if you work with an advisor through it. But you have to be with an advisor who even knows that this is an option for you to be able to take advantage of it, right? And that's really where I'm kind of pushing the issues, to, to be working with somebody that knows how to do this and for you to be aware that it's something that can be done. Now, when we come back from the break, I'm going to give you three concepts, three implementable things that you can do this year to help you proactively manage your income taxes. All right. Stick with us on the break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about three things that you can do to proactively manage your income taxes. We'll be right back. Hey, folks, you know, there are more than 500 different ways to claim your Social Security benefits, and most Americans will rely on their IRAs and 401ks to survive retirement. The pressure to make the right decisions at this stage of life can be enormous, as are the consequences for making a wrong decision. Victor Medina, host of Make It Last, is a certified financial planner that specializes in helping people in or nearing retirement, working with families that have been diligent savers and who value a trusted advisor. Victor is is able to put together a customized total protection retirement plan that helps clients answer four important questions. Can you afford to retire? Are you overpaying your income taxes? Can your portfolio be improved? Can you eliminate or reduce threats to your retirement? It's never been more important to make sure your ducks are in a row, and it's never been harder to make your nest egg secure. The time to act is now. Call 609-476-9269 or email info at privateclientfamily.com to schedule your no-cost, no-obligation first meeting and get on the road to total protection. 
Well, welcome back uh, from the break. This is Make It Last. You're listening to us, and we're talking about proactively manage your income taxes. Uh, if you've stuck with us this long, that means that we have managed not to bore you to death talking about income taxes. But uh, we're going to spend this last segment talking about specific things that you can do to help you manage your income taxes. Now, as a reminder, you know, you're going to want to do this because it will allow you to lower the impact of required minimum distributions. Uh, may allow you to make conversions to Roth, which are tax-free accounts. Um, and one of the other reasons is that it will allow you to reduce the income taxes on the inheritance that you leave behind. You know, many people are pretty clear that they're not going to spend through their retirement before they die, and they're going to leave it behind. Well, if you leave an IRA behind, you're essentially um, making sure that your kids pay taxes at their rates when they receive that money. And so if your kids are working, they're probably in a higher tax bracket than you. So if you convert money out at a lower tax bracket and lock in the tax rate, 15%, then when they receive that money, they don't have to pay it at the higher rate. You know, they could be at 33%. So lots of good reasons to think about doing that uh, in terms of, um, yeah, lots of good reasons for doing that. So let's talk about three things that you can do that will help you proactively manage your income taxes. Now, two of them are pretty straightforward. I don't want to kind of go through the calculations on them um, because we'll eat up too much time in the show and it's a little too complicated to do the math on the air. But I will spend a lot of time on the third one. So the first two is to move money out of your IRA up to your next tax bracket. So remember before in the prior segment, I talked about a family, fictional family, making like $50,000 of taxable income. Well, in current tax brackets, that's $25,000 that they can move out of their IRA and lock that in at 15%. Now, that's not tax-free, right? You're going to pay taxes, but you're going to lock in the tax rate at 15% and make sure that you don't have to pay that in the future at a higher rate. Now, that calculation is not a straight-line calculation because the amount of taxes that you pay on your Social Security income is driven by the amount of income that you're getting from other sources. So as you increase the distributions out of the IRA, more of your social security may be taxable. It's a three-part test that's done on Schedule A. You can get software, like you know, buy TurboTax and play with you know, moving more money out and you see how much money is taxable. But the idea here is I don't want you to think that it's a straight line calculation. If you more move more, more money out of your IRA, you might in fact owe more taxes on the social security. So you just kind of watch that. Second recommendation is uh, is to think about harvesting your capital gains at 0%. This is one great way to pay 0% in taxes. So most people know that long-term capital gains is taxed at 15%. And that's a pretty common you know, concept. People know capital gains, 15%. There's actually another tax rate for capital gains, and that's 0%. And you pay 0% in capital gains on the amount of money that you convert at long-term capital gains, which is below your 15% threshold. So let's kind of work that out. My family making $50,000, they can convert capital gains of $25,000 and pay 0% on it. 0%, right? So this is essentially one way to pay 0% in taxes. And now you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't do it twice. You can't do 25000 and then $25,000 of income. That doesn't quite work, you know, from your IRA. But you can do 25000 of capital gains and pay 0%. All right. Again, calculation best done with your advisor. However, here's one that you should know about and your advisor, if they're worth anything, should be doing for you. Right. And this has to do with investment location or asset location. It's not asset allocation, right? That's diversification across a broad set of asset classes. However, this is asset location and it works like this. People understand that their stocks essentially can grow and pay long-term capital gains rates. And people understand that bonds pay interest. It's one of the reasons why they hold them in the portfolio because it's throwing off interest pretty regularly. The amount of interest that's thrown off is taxed at ordinary income tax rates. So if you're the 15%, 25% bracket, whatever it is, you're going to pay it at that rate. That's the rate that you're going to pay that income. So if we think about where assets should be, here's a real quick litmus test to whether or not your financial advisor knows what they're doing. 
if you look at your statement and you own exactly the same investments in every kind of account that you have, that your brokerage account has the same mutual funds as your IRA, as the as your Roth IRA, if they all have the same investments, then your broker doesn't know what they're doing. Your advisor has no clue how to maximize this stuff for you. Because what you should have is 100% of your bonds, or as much as will fit, of your bond portfolio in your IRA. So that when the interest is being thrown off of that, you don't pay the taxes on that money until you move it out of the IRA, right? Because that's a tax deferred account on growth. So we won't be paying that until we move it out. Whereas if we held those bonds inside of your brokerage account, the after-tax account, you'd be paying that at your marginal income taxes. So there are certain sized slots for certain investments based on you know, pretty clear understanding about how taxes go. So we want as much bonds as can fit in your IRA. We also want as much of your equity or stock funds in your after-tax account because those grow and are paid at long-term capital gains rates, which we talked about as being, you know, either 0 or 15%. If we put the stock and equity funds into the IRA, then even though we've held them for long-term capital gains, when they come out, you're going to pay ordinary income taxes on them because every distribution out of your IRA is at ordinary income tax rates. And it's going to go way too deep to talk about what should be in your Roth because it has to do with pass-through taxation on real estate. But the idea is that there are certain funds that should be held in certain accounts, certain kinds of assets in certain kinds of accounts. And if you review your statement, and you're seeing that you own the same investments in every account, big no-no. That's no good. We know, in fact, that that's not um, right. It doesn't work for, for, it's not the right strategy. So, like, go visit somebody different. <laughs> go visit somebody that knows what they're doing because this person who's working with you clearly doesn't. All right. Um, so that's uh, a strategy that you can use now, because if you reallocate your investments so that they're optimized on income taxes, it will give you so much leverage on how your money is used because of your way, your ability to kind of, you know, manage pro proactively manage your income taxes. So that's huge, 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 huge. In any event, um, we're going to wrap up for today. I want to thank you for joining us, listening to my rant about yogurt. Go try Fage, <laughs> Fage yogurt. Uh, go proactively income your uh, manage your income taxes. And uh, if you can't, can't capable of doing it, work with an advisor that can do it. All right. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, that you're working with the best people. Um, if you've got any questions about this and you'd like to learn more about our services, go ahead and contact us. You know that we are at Medina Law Group or Private Client Capital Group. Do a web search for that stuff. Send an email to the show and we will forward it off to the uh, to the law firm or to the financial services firm and be able to um, help that uh, with you. All right. We're talking about total wealth planning when you're working with us. And if that's something that you're interested in, we'd love to hear more from you. So this has been Make It Last. We want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, if you like this episode, please go ahead and go to iTunes and uh, give it a great review. It will help people um, find the show. And um, if, the, if you like the show and you are good friends with somebody that you think could benefit, do me a favor send them a link to it. Tell them to go on iTunes and download this and all the prior episodes so they can listen and be as up to speed as you are on all of these topics. So thanks so much for joining uh, us today. We're going to catch you next Saturday. Uh, and uh, when we do that, we're going to have another great topic for you. So uh, that's it. We're going to catch you next Saturday. This has been Make It Last, helping you keep your legal ducks in a row and your financial nest egg secure. See you next time. The foregoing content reflects the opinions of Medina Law Group, LLC, and Private Client Capital Group, LLC, and is subject to change at any time without notice. Content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment or legal advice or a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security or to follow any legal strategy. There is no guarantee that the strategies, statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses, which would reduce returns. 
All investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There's no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. We recommend that you consult with a professional dedicated to your needs.